Okay, hello everyone. So today we'll have a presentation about 3D deep learning and 3D deep learning is a big topic and it is not possible to feasibly fit everything uh, into one short presentation. So this one will be more about trends to give you an idea of what's going on today in uh, this domain. Uh, by the way, can you hear me well or am I speaking too quietly? Yes, everything is okay. Okay, thank you. So let's start off in a classic way, just a small reminder of how we can represent 3D data. Uh, I think uh, all of you are familiar with uh, some of them. So among them are voxels, meshes, point clouds, oak trees, descriptors, multi-views, uh, RGB depth, images, graphs, projections, and CAD models. But if we're talking about trends, uh, currently trends are those are uh, pushed by the devices so we capture data with data with and those are generally lidars and uh, cameras so as a result we can see a lot of uh, multi-view point clouds and depth maps uh, circulating in the solutions uh, for 3d deep learning today and speaking of data well it will be uh, very wonderful if you would have uh, a single mono image and somehow we could acquire a good 3D representation of the object from this image, but we are not here yet. But in the future, I think we will be at this uh, point of progress. The rest of the presentation will be divided in the separate sections uh, of the 3D object deep learning uh, applications. One of them is 3D or 6D object detection. So, this is um, this can be divided into separate uh, categories because uh, we can uh, detect some objects like, for example, shoes. And this is a good example because shoes uh, are not always on the ground. So you will have to also estimate pitch, yaw, and rotation for shoes. And therefore, not only you have to estimate 3D uh, uh, position, but also an orientation. And so you have six dimensions here. The other story is with automotive domain, uh, because here you can simplify things greatly. Uh, you assume that the car is on the road and the road is flat. It is very unlikely that the car is flying or something like that, so you should only estimate uh, the position in 3D space and hence 3D uh, bounded box. To give you an idea of how this works uh, architecturally, uh, here is a good example of um, Media pipe object run, which is a relatively recent solution. And this is a great uh, example because um, the actual architecture is pretty simple. You have uh, a network for feature extraction, for example, a ResNet or something. And then you have a so called head uh, to do a 2D bounded box uh, estimation. And then you have another head, which is, uh, oh, I didn't mention the head is basically an MLP. Then you have another head that takes this to the bounding box coordinates and regresses them to the projection of 3D bounding box coordinates. That can later be used to uh, solve perspective and point problem and have a 3D bounding box, an actual 3D bounding box. Um, and actually, this sounds pretty easy, I would say, to understand. Uh, the question is why do we have uh, this only in 2010? 2021, not, not earlier. And the answer is, uh, it is actually relatively recently when we uh, could have started capturing data with our smartphones, uh, with uh, already argument, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, with annotations using uh, AR capabilities, uh, capabilities of the phones. So therefore we can gather a lot of data and you know fit it to uh, and simple architecture as many pipes. Um, if we speak about automotive domain, uh, the research here is a bit different. Uh, so in automotive domain, we always want to push uh, the solutions that give us 95% accuracy to those desired 99.9% accuracy because this is an automotive domain. Uh, all things have to be dandy here and uh, everything must work 
but with uh, as good precision as, as possible. So uh, most of these solutions, they try to refine uh, their uh, accuracy. For example, this solution, it emphasizes the uh, symmetric nature of uh, cars. And uh, it is um, trying to ex to um, learn occluded shapes of the car. So the problem with the LiDAR, for example, is that the beam hits the car and it returns to the LiDAR. Uh, this is how it works. And the beam cannot pass through the car. So you can see only one side of the car when you hit it with the LiDAR beam. Uh, and this solution it tries to uh, reconstruct the full car from only knowing how the side of the car looks like. So that you can use the refined data to boost the accuracy of your algorithm. Um, I mean, th uh, 3D object detection algorithm. Um, another trend in 3D object detection is the usage of transformers as uh, in every major part of deep learning, I guess, transformers are overtaking the industry. Uh, one way to do the object detection is to transform the point cloud into the voxel representation and to run a 3D convolution through the voxel. Uh, but uh, convolutions have um, quite a disadvantage. So there is a notion of uh, receptive field in convolution networks. And this basically means that uh, you cannot relate the whole image to a certain point in convolutions. Um, in order to increase the receptive field, you have to add more layers, which is expensive, or you have to add max pooling or increase stride, which is equivalent to subsampling, which means loss in uh, information loss. So instead, we now use transformers. Um, and the perk of transformers is that they can process the whole sequence of words or the whole image or the whole page of the voxels in one run. And we expect that it can relate any point to any other point. Uh, so that's why, for example, this solution uses voxel transform. Then there is um, a task of object reconstruction. And I think uh, the most incredible solution of this year uh, is Nerf. I think uh, many of you have heard of NERF. Sorry, I have to exit the presentation mode in order to play a short video. So this is a demonstration. I think uh, most of you already seen what NERF is capable of. So it is pretty amazing. This is achievable by feeding a sequence of images um, from different viewpoints. Yeah, I think it's NERF. Um, and I think uh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about NERF. So what is uh, NERF? Um, the best way to think about NERF is that NERF is a 3D model when it is fit. Uh, you can think it is similar to, for example, SDF, uh, if you remember what's that, uh, SDF function, yeah. So, uh, and. In terms of architecture, it is actually just an MLP, which is which was quite surprising to me. Uh, so this MLP uh, represents a function that takes uh, coordinates and uh, a direction as an input, and it outputs an RGB value and transparency for the given coordinate. And how it is trained? So basically, you have a set of images with transformation matrices because you have to know what is the location of the camera when uh, it took the image. So you can ray trace the image and acquire data for fitting this um, nerve. <clears throat> um, if you imagine, uh, however, it, it is not as uh, simple as I just said. Uh, there is uh, There are complications. Uh, the main complication is that if you try to do the same thing, on a 2D domain, which is fitting an image into the MLP, uh, you will actually discover that it is hard to do if you use X, Y coordinates. And 2018 studies st states that neural networks are biased to learning lower frequency functions, um, which means you have to bring those coordinates to the higher frequency function. For example, by mapping them with um, wave functions, multiple wave functions, for example. 
and mapping um, 3D coordinates to wave functions uh, was a solution uh, in 2021, I believe, for the NERF, but NVIDIA took it even further and they um, removed uh, wave functions and incorporated a trainable hash table, I, I mean trainable, uh, yeah, uh, their own coordinate system, which uses indexes that are put in a trainable hash table. Uh, it's really not easy to explain what's going on. I'm not even sure I understood, but this thing, uh, it has an advantage of accessing uh, points in a 3D space by a hash table, which is uh, which which is all one complexity. Uh, and therefore, NERF can actually be fit in like in a matter of seconds, 30 seconds or something. Another very cool thing about NERF is that, as I said, it doesn't only take uh, X, Y, Z coordinates, but it also takes a direction. And this allows NERF to learn some pretty cool things like reflections, for example, or shades, shaders. Uh, as you can see on this image, when looked, <clears throat> uh, this is a nerve representation. When looked uh, from one direction, you don't see the reflection of the sun on the base. But when looked on the other, uh, from the other direction, you actually can see the reflections, which is really cool. It boosts um, realism by a lot. Uh, that's it for the nerve. So another contender uh, for um, object reconstruction is TransMBSNet. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, well, I did a presentation on TransMBSNet, so I will not be talking too much about it. But I put it into this presentation because it demonstrates uh, a few really trendy things in the deep learning. So there are three apparent thread, uh, trends in this uh, exact architecture, which I met several multiple times. The first one is feature network uh, pyramid. Uh, you can see FPN here. Uh, so this is a convolutional network which is used for feature extraction. And this uh, block is used, uh, reused multiple times in different architectures. The other trend is the usage of transformers for he heavy lifting. For In this particular case, it is feature matching task. Again, transformers. And the third trend you think that uh, you can meet in uh, nowadays architectures is coarse to fine architecture, uh, which uh, basically uh, does one thing. It takes, uh, for example, a small feature map. Uh, it computes everything with the transformer. It outputs uh, a, a final result. So you can then use this result with a bigger feature map, skipping all the computations. Uh, to refine the output image to the size, to the desired size, and thus boosting the performance greatly. Uh, yeah, so as I said, transformers for feature match and CMS for feature structure, course, to find architecture. And of course, you need to have transformation matrices everywhere. So, like, this is uh, things that you need everywhere <laughs> in uh, modern architectures today. Uh, a few examples um, of, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry for images of my cat. Uh, I, I closed uh, the tab uh, which I had opened previously, uh, sorry for that. I wanted to show the video of NERF uh, that I had, but I closed it. So basically, the NERF is a pretty cool thing. It captured details of the plants pretty well. Uh, one thing you can see that uh, you don't have anything uh, if you didn't capture it on the image. So NERF will not generate missing data for you. Uh, and you actually have to capture things in all the uh, directions if you want to see them from all the directions. If you try to look at the object from the direction which a nerf didn't see, let's say, so you, you will not see anything feasible there. So, yeah, that's uh, a moment that you have to understand about nerf. And then there is an output from TransMBSNet, which is uh, a pretty good reconstruction, but I agree with me that nerf looks much, much cooler. So, yeah, that's for object uh, reconstruction. 
then there is also a task for 3D shape classification of segmentation. Um, and <clears throat> uh, the applications are pretty obvious again. So for example, mapping this big data or uh, again, uh, understanding what's going on uh, from, from the car or the LiDAR car, car LiDAR, sorry. Um, and how it was done previously. So you had a point cloud and you transform it to the voxel. Uh, you again run 3D convolution, convolutions to extract features and then you pass features to MLP to come up with the final result. Um, so, uh, but it has a big uh, disadvantage because when you uh, transform point cloud to voxel, you probably will lose a lot of detailization. Uh, in 2017, there was a point net and uh, people expected it to learn features by itself. So the main thing about this architecture, I believe, is that they, it uses only a matrix, matrix multiplications and it worked. But today, people try to, um, to do some kind of feature crafting on a point clouds. Because point clouds by itself, uh, it's point cloud by itself. It's just a set of points. It has no information about the shape, no information at all. So people try to craft those features, those structures, to then pass them to uh, into MLP. In this paper, for example, they try to use these triangle orientations and umbrella orientations, as well as the point clouds themselves, and they pass it to MLP to learn shapes much better. Uh, another similar solution, <clears throat> but here they have, uh, I mean, it's not similar, but the idea is again to craft some features that can represent shapes. Uh, the idea here is to walk the point cloud uh, to have those curves that are then passed to MLP. Uh, then there is a task for 3D face and body reconstruction and um, like face reconstruction basically means uh, trying to reconstruct a 3D face from an RGB image. And this is one of the, I would say, oldest topics in deep learning because this is one that boosted deep learning greatly by showing the commercial value of the deep learning. Um, we can all remember you know, those filters, for example, uh, Instagram and Snapchat filters that boosted deep learning and computer vision. Uh, so the topic is pretty old, but people try to increase the complexity even further. For example, in this paper, they try to <clears throat> add also displacement maps. Uh, I'm not sure if it is visible, uh, but uh, models here, they have wrinkles all over the forehead and uh, cheeks, which adds a lot of uh, realism and emotion, I believe, to them. The other one tries to, for example, learn some really obscure emotions, like some really emotional emotions. <laughs> uh, and the other one, for example, tries to combine uh, face estimation, uh, hand pose estimation and body estimation to one solution, which uh, is pretty reasonable, I'd say, and pretty useful, I think. And I just wanted to uh, point out the trend right here. So we can see uh, architecture of one of the solutions. This is the one with the displacement maps. And uh, as you can see, it follows encoder or decoder architecture where you uh, take an image, encode some uh, hidden representations and try to uh, decode them as something else like displacement map, texture map, and uh, face shape. And please notice here that they do not just uh, output um, a depth map or a point cloud or else for the shape. They actually learn a model, a flame model. And this is a thing that I encountered multiple times. It actually requires you to uh, register and enter credentials when you try to run the open source solution from the GitHub. Uh, yeah, so it has an API. And this is a model which is uh, used a lot as I can tell. Uh, so it is a model that uh, basically lets you to configure a face with 300 shape options. Uh, I mean, yeah, uh, and 100 emotion components, not, not options, but components. Uh, so the 
titleization is pretty good uh, in this um, model. Yeah, yeah, and this model is learned in those solutions. Um, so here, one of our ones, uh, this dude, I don't know if you can tell right away, but it is Steve Carell. Uh, I don't know, I think that knows, uh, it is definitely his nose here. And then this uh, person is uh, Jennifer Lawrence. Uh, I think you can tell it by uh, puffy cheeks, for example, that she has. This is the other solution. It's, uh, it's a displacement map I told you about, but I couldn't put it on the model, so it looks kind of creepy. But yeah, here you have it. Then there is a topic of 3D pose estimation, and this is one of the stalled topics, I would say, but uh, there are a few things to take away. So you want to basically uh, have a 3D skeleton of a person uh which uh, describes uh, the pose and um the main way to do it is to first estimate it to the skeleton and then regress it to 3d skeleton and this um approach has uh, a relatively good runtime but uh, it really struggles uh, when you try to uh, have multiple people in one scene uh, so one of the solutions for example uh, you can see two people overlapping and it really struggles. But even if those people would not overlap, it would only detect only one person. So that's very um, unsustainable, I'd say. Uh, the other solution, it actually uh, estimates poses for uh, two separate persons pretty well, but uh, it doesn't relate them in any way. So it, they have different uh, coordinates each other so it's not good when you have when you want to relate two person in one scene uh, for that of course uh, there are solutions one of them is pretty old but uh, no anyway it's a good one i believe um the only takeaway in such solutions that you need to have uh, a multi-view so not the one, one camera but multiple and this exact solution works uh, by extracting features uh, of people, uh, of uh, crops of people, and trying to match those features across different views to uh, actually determine uh, that, uh, yes, this exact person is located here and, and they are on this image, which uh, then can be used to um, to put the 3D skeletons in a single uh, 3D scene. Uh, we tried the solution and um, I don't know if it is visible to you, but uh, the red skeleton is on the chair on every image. So it means like this is the same person uh, on every image and it is detectable by the algorithm, which is good, I guess. Um, then the other an interesting scene I encountered about um, Post estimation uh, is this plug and play, as they call it, uh, network, which um, basically smooths uh, the, uh, the skeleton motion, uh, which can be present um, frequently because of you know, inconsistencies. So it removes jitters. Uh, the disadvantage is that it probably needs some kind of buffering but uh, and i know i don't know it's one of the um, interesting solutions in, in this domain so there is also a task of 3d implicit representation and we actually had uh, this presentation um, about sign distance function and it is pretty much still used so i didn't really find much more on this topic uh, but I think uh, we can actually toss NERF into this category also, because if you think so, NERF is also represents a 3D object. Um, and then there is uh, 3D texture generation. And actually, when I was doing this research, there was nothing interesting. Like, this is one of the best solutions. And, uh, it takes uh, text prompt as input and now puts um, a 3D model of a bird depending on that uh, text prompt and as you can see like 
the birds are not uh, even too detailed. Uh, but uh, recently we've got this gene fusion solution uh, and uh, this is like a combination of nerve and stable diffusion. And I think that's a great candidate for a future presentation. So what it does, it takes, uh, again, text prompt as input and outputs a nerve uh, of what you just typed. Another, I think, wonderful idea for the presentation would be to uh, explain how differentiable rendering works and what are the types of differentiable rendering. Because if you think uh, this is basically the main thing you have to understand in deep learning, how do you assess uh, the rendered thing? And how you do you make correction in your... Um, so summarization, uh, a few points. Uh, so uh, 3D deep learning is le uh, a relatively young uh, direction um, and it has been developing significantly, significantly sorry, <laughs> in the past two years. Um, AR definitely and LiDAR definitely fuel this research. So as a result, we have uh, a lot of uh, multi-views, death maps and point clouds recently. Uh, and uh, that's kind of subjective, but I think that with NERF and uh, stable diffusion, uh, we will have uh, much help in uh, 3D object reconstruction and generation. And that's all, thank you.